Are we missing some people? Hmm. I don't know. I think this is who's supposed to be on the, the virtual side of it. I think there are the, the others are in alive. Do you see that they're asking if we can hear them in the chat? It says, we can hear you. Can you hear us? Oh, yeah. Uh, I do not see that. Yeah, no, I can see that. Yeah, I can see that. So I can say no. I hear them. I can just hear That's them. That's they're on mute. They're on mute. Can you hear us? No, we yes. can, yeah. It's hard. No. Okay, we cannot hear. Can you hear us? We can hear you now, yeah. No, we yes. can, yeah. It's hard. Um, yeah. Okay, we cannot hear. Can you hear us? We can hear you now, yeah. Yes. We can, yeah. yeah. Hi, Fran. I see you. If you need to speak it here, please ask. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. Can you turn the volume down? Martha, Fran is one of my favorite people. <laughs> Mine too. <laughs> she came to DC when I was there. I don't know if you heard. Yeah, yeah. No, she, she, yeah, yeah. That's I, oh gosh. You posted that. It's great. It's my mute. Uh, I'm not going to hear them. I don't think they'll hear us. We can hear you now. I'm not going to hear them. I don't think they'll hear us. We can hear you now. I'm not going to hear them. I don't think they'll hear us. I guess why why do you need two running? You're running um this is the this is two put on the screen and this one is um to have access to that. Um I can try and
So Fran texted me to say that they can't get it to work without hearing themselves. So it's causing a very big echo. Right. Can they hear us? Because maybe we can just talk and they can listen. Yeah. I'll ask that. I will ask that question. We could do this in two sections. We could have the the, the virtual panelists talk and then we could we could probably mute. We could do this in two sections. We could have the, the, the virtual panelists talk and then we could we could probably mute. We could do this in two sections. We could have the, the, the virtual Are you Stephanie? You're doing up two different things. Yeah, right? yeah, yeah. We are because. Well, then they're going to compete. You're going to have a debate. Yeah, 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 yeah. 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 As you say, we need to put the questions into the chat feature and we could talk about yeah. hearing. Yep. Martha, to Martha, did you see the NIH press release about the phage first NIH funded uh, phage therapy trial? Yeah, it's brilliant. And with a quote too. from Fauci, which is pretty cool. <laughs> so yeah. just so you guys are aware, we are broadcasting live to oh. lots of people on YouTube. So um, I'm oh. just going to start talking to them <laughs> and asking you guys questions because at least we can keep them entertained. Um, so should we should we just quickly introduce ourselves to yeah. the YouTube watchers so that they're not just sitting there in dead space? So hi everybody, I'm Will. Um, I'm the director of the documentary. Diane, you want to go? Sure. I'm Diane Mallory's mom. She wrote the amazing book that Will made his film about. I hope you get to read it. Martha. So I'm Martha Clokey. I'm a professor of microbiology at the University of Leicester. Uh, my research focuses on bacteriophages, and we've just opened the first UK bacteriophage centre. So we've now got Oxford has rejoined the stream. So um, can you can you hear us, Stephanie? Sorry, Helen, I cut you off just as you were about to have your moment. It's all right. Would you like me to introduce myself now? I think you probably should while they're figuring this out. <laughs> um, I'm Helen Spencer. I'm the lead for the lung transplant service at Grace Ormond Street Hospital, and I used phage for one of my patients after transplant. Wow. I say bravo. <laughs> yeah, amazing. What it's year? What year? Uh, four years ago. So 2018? Um, was that to combat a specific bug? I'm I'm a lay person, so please forgive my ignorance. Uh, but I'm just going to ask questions because I find this world so fascinating. Uh, yeah. So um, mostly um, before we had CFTR modulators, either gene therapy medicine for CF, uh, many children ended up needing transplant for cystic fibrosis, which is what Mallory was affected by and um, many of those children were infected by a really resistant bacteria so something called my mycobacterium abscessus uh, and so my scenario was that um, we transplanted 13 of those patients and uh, sadly five of those patients had reinfection after transplant and died after transplant and so um, when one of my patients and it's the patient that has been published so I'll mention her name Isabel, I'm, I'm sad oh, to say that you know, she's, she's no longer with us, uh, uh, sadly, but um, she had reinfection after transplant. And, uh, and so when we were sort of struggling and not winning with, um, you know, conventional therapy, her mum her came to me and asked me whether or not I would consider phage therapy. 
So that's how I got involved. I'm a clinician. I'm not um, a clever academic. Um, and so we, we went on a journey together to get um, Phage to treat her infection. So that, that's the sort of the bottom line. And, and that's why I'm here today. Do you know, I speak about her because what I say is, how do you define success? If she died after a few years, is that a success or a failure? From my perspective, she got extra years that Mallory didn't get. So that's a huge success, even if other people will then say, well, it didn't work. But from my yeah. perspective, you gave her extra lives. I mean, extra years. Yeah. And, um, you know, I think I think it certainly worked to die. And um, uh, whether or not the infection is what actually um uh, caused her her sad demise. Um, you know, I can't really talk talk to you about online, um, but I think it was probably unrelated. Um, so oh, for I, me, yeah. so for me, the phage was a success for for Isabel. Yeah, certainly. Okay. Can, Looks like they're with us. Can you hear us? Yes. Um, yeah. Finally, it worked. <laughs> Sorry for this. Uh... <laughs> These technical issues. Um, the camera is obviously not where it should be. Um, where the camera is, but it's... <laughs> you can hear us at least. Yes, I can. Would you like to speak here, Richard, so they can see you at least? Okay, so my name's Richard James, uh, Emeritus Professor, University of Nottingham Medical School. Worked, uh, taught about antibiotics, antibiotic resistance for 40 years. Tried to develop novel uh, antibiotics called bactericins, protein antibiotics produced by bacteria to kill others. Realized that phase therapy had a similar potential, so I call it these platform technologies that we can hopefully develop. And that's why I was very keen when Stephanie asked me to join Fetch UK to get involved. So I'm supposed to provide you um, uh, a brief description of the panelists, but I think given the, the time, we haven't got much time to go. Um, so we've got uh, Diane Shader Smith, Mallory's mother, who you, you saw uh, in the film. And uh, we had the pleasure of meeting her uh, when the film was shown in Leicester. Uh, Will Battersby, um, director of the film, again, we saw him in, in lecture in Leicester. He's born in the UK and Will has worked in America for many years as a film producer and this was his uh, directorial uh, debut. Simon Lewis-Jones, who is sitting here in the audience. Um, so Simon um, turned to phage therapy uh, after a, a mixed infection, two different bacteria, went to Georgia 26, uh, 2018 and phage treatment for nine months after a treatment there and uh, appears to be healthy and well. So. But we would like it that people don't have to go to Georgia to get phage therapy. Uh, Phil Mitchell Moore in the middle here, respiratory consultant for Old and Devon and Exeter Hospital. Um, main areas of interest, chronic lung conditions, particularly bronchiectasis passes and cystic fibrosis um, and is um, uh, getting involved in trying to use phase therapy. Uh, Helen Spencer, who's a uh, remote um, respiratory pediatrician, clinical lead for the lung transplant at Great Ormond Street Hospital um, and has used phase therapy on a CF patient in the UK, which was published uh, Melissa Haynes, Dr. Melissa Haynes is in the, uh, in the audience here on the panel. So, um, uh, works in, in Leicester uh, along with uh, Professor Kaloki, we'll see you in a minute, and is developing um, phage cocktails to treat urinary, urinary tract infections, UTIs, and currently testing the efficacy of this in a, in a mouse model with a view to carrying out human clinical trials in the near future. And then Professor Martha Clokey, Professor of Microbiology, University of Leicester, leads a large research group working on the therapeutic development of phages to target human and animal pathogens. Um, and um, last but not least, um, Dr. Fran Hodges here, um, who's a 
uh, Knowledge Transfer Manager on Emerging Technology and Industries team at Innovate UK. Um, did a P PhD on phage biology and metabolomics at Leicester and with uh, Professor Crokey. And is establishing a nationwide phage innovation network to uh, drive uh, development of technology. So that's the panel, and um, Fran is going to uh, uh, keep the panelists under control and ask the questions. Thank you very much, Richard. Can you all hear me okay online? I'm not at the, okay, I'll stay where I am then. <laughs> um, so yes, yeah, so as we're a bit pressed for time, I'm just gonna go ahead and ask some uh, questions we had previously prepared. We do have any spare time at the end, questions from the audience here. Um, but I'm going to start uh, with Diane. Diane, lovely to see you again. <laughs> Learn um, your kiss. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, just wanted to ask you, really, about since, since you've started sharing Madeline's story in, in the many different forms, the book, uh, obviously the wonderful documentary, and the different talks that you give. Uh, what progress, if any at all, have you witnessed relating to opinions on both? AMR and phage therapy? So much progress, it's mind boggling and exciting and also heartbreaking since it wasn't in time for Mallory, but when Mallory got her phages, there was no center in the United States devoted to phage therapy. Now there are four, plus other major institutions are doing research, companies are, doing, are developing phages, they're developing um, products to work with phage therapy, they're going after biofilm, and the UK, Australia, and the US are all talking to each other. So that's also progress. Watching what you guys are doing in the UK, um, hearing Dr. Spencer talk about treating a patient in 2018. I think Mallory was the first patient. I know she was the first patient in the United States to be treated with phage, phages in 2017. And since then, there have been wonderful examples of anecdotal use and then the most exciting news of all is that the NIH has just announced the first ever NIH funded clinical trial. And I'm extremely proud to say that Mallory's legacy fund, which came from monies raised from friends and family who wanted to do something to honor Mallory's memory, made the inaugural grant. So there's a lot that's been happening. And plus everything that's going on in Martha's lab is pretty exciting. <laughs> Yeah, but I don't want to talk about that. I'll let her talk about that. <laughs> Thank you very much, Diane. It was absolutely, I was absolutely thrilled to see that news, the NIH, NIH funded uh, trial announced only this week, I think. Um, yeah. So, yeah, yeah. Really great. Um, so we're going to move on to Will now. Um, so, I mean, Will, I've seen this, this documentary a number of times, and it's equally moving every single time I watch it. I think everybody in the room can agree that it's uh, masterpiece in storytelling and it really just does such a wonderful job of telling Mallory's story and showing you who she really was and everything she went through. Um, and we just wanted to ask, uh, when you embarked on, on this project, what kind of impact did you anticipate Mallory's story having? Um, and has the actual impact been different from what you expected? It's been very, very different. Um... You know, I, I really didn't set out to make a film that would be so wholly embraced by the scientific community, the academic community, the US government, the UK government. Sorry, it's very nice to see you again, Fran. Sorry. Um, <laughs> uh, you know, I really, I, I, I was completely mesmerized by Mallory's story when I read the book. And I just thought this would be an opportunity to kind of do something slightly different in the documentary space and actually tell a very cinematic story, you know, a sort of classic American coming of age story, you know, the twist being that, you know, the girl at the center of it knew she was dying. So I really, I set out to make quite a very sort of populist movie, right? Um, and you can sort of, you know, you can tell from all of the musical choices and, you know, I really wanted to sort of, you know, draw people into the emotional journey, you know, and I thought, you know, it'll, it'll have a lot of impact, you know, it'll kind of, you know, it, it'll give the sort of the general public a sense of, you know what cf is i knew it would be embraced by the cf community um, and we really thought that was going to be the kind of big core audience for the film i mean what's been completely um humbling and and very gratifying is you know that it's been really picked up uh, both by the you know the phage scientific community and by the amr community at large and um you know they diane has been sort of you know 
I think traveling the globe is to put it mildly uh, with the book, the film, her talks, you know, um, and to, you know, it, it, it's just, it's so gratifying to have the film being used in a way that, you know, to support all of your work, um, which is so, I find it so extraordinary. So yeah, it's been, it's been fantastic. I think it's really special to have um, such a wonderful story with that, but, but, but tell so many different stories, just the one movie, let alone with the book as well. So um, it's really special. It's really special to be able to hear it. Um, and so we're going to move on to Simon now. Thank you very much for joining us here today. Yeah, that's um, my experience with face therapy. Back in 2018, I developed a series of UTIs weren't particularly treated very well, which went to a prostate infection. Uh, prostate infection feeds long courses of antibiotics. Unfortunately, for my prostate infections, I've had a lot of skin infections. And I've probably had about 20 courses of antibiotics in about 18 months. During those courses, I had a couple of rounds of C. diff. Um, so the prospect of going on antibiotics for four or five weeks when I've had couple of courses of C. diff didn't particularly go down very well with me and I could last 12, 14 days in rural antibiotics before I was approaching C. diff and gut issues. Uh, various talks with my biology teams um, and see neurologists, they all kind of held their hands up and went, we don't really know what to do with you. That's well, not very helpful. Um, and then through my own research, um, I managed to get in touch with the clinic in Tbilisi at Eliava. I was fortunate enough that I had some life savings that I could invest in my treatment. Um, my parents and a few friends and a few doctors were like a bit surprised, but I thought, what choice have I got? I wasn't really ill, fortunate at the time. I took the step quite early on um, to go over to Tbilisi. Managed to get the test beforehand by shipping them over, by shipping samples over, which is not easy. And then spent two weeks in Tbilisi having oral phages and having suppositories. Um, sent me on my way, and then I had about nine months remote treatment. And, you know, testing every three months, sending more samples off, sending more samples back, doing a couple of microgen tests in the US as well, sending those off. And after about nine months, the Enterococcus bacillus that I had was, you know, eradicated. And I don't know where I'd be without phage treatment now, to be fair. And still with having C. diff and the antibiotics I take, it's not taken lightly. I've got a carrier. So it's safe to say that receiving phage therapy in the UK is really life. Yeah. It's also safe to say that having access to it in the UK would have made, made life a lot, a, a lot, a lot easier, yeah. Um, so we've been lucky enough to hear from several patients. So there's, there's four patients that I'm working with at the minute in Exeter who um, have a condition called bronchiectasis. So it's, I guess you'd say, like a cousin condition of cystic fibrosis. Um, patients have sort of difficult and hard to treat infections and very high antibiotic burden. Um, but these patients are interested, they are keen, and despite what's happened in the past two years, uh, not remotely put off by the thoughts of having viruses put into their lungs. Um, one of the patients we've got isolates from a pseudomonas, which we've sent over to the Citizen Phage Library, uh, which has been set up by Ben Templeton, who's here in Oxford uh, today. Um, and in the laboratory, found over 60 phages, uh, which in the lab uh, work against the isolates of pseudomonas from this patient. So that's hugely exciting, knowing that these phages are literally just across town um, from the hospital. With regards to sort of the next steps, we're building allies in the hospital, including senior microbiologist, antimicrobial pharmacist, 
and have a, a sort of a pathway set out by the hospital boards and various boards to go through, including sort of a new drug group, the medical management group, uh, before finally the clinical effectiveness committee within the hospital. At that point then, it'll be the, the journey from, as I say, across town from the university lab to the hospital. Um, and I, this is a bit that will need to be ironed out, but it, unbelievably, it, it may be the case that these isolates and phages will then go out of the UK uh, to be prepped before hopefully getting MHRA sign off to have them back into the country uh, before being able to hopefully give this treatment to these patients who are suffering with these chronic infections. And we've had some really useful conversations recently, including with Helen, who I was very grateful for her past experience and input. Um, but yeah, it's, it's, not, it's not a straightforward pathway. And um, we'll pass over to Helen now. Helen, are you able to just tell us about your experience with successfully treating a patient with phage therapy? Yeah, you ask about what the barriers are, and it felt like there was an absolute mountain of barriers um, to get phage for my uh, patient, um, which we overcame in 12 weeks. So from the lab to the patient took us 12 weeks, but there were a lot of steps uh, in that process. Um, so I, I think, you know, what does it take to get phage therapy? Uh, luck. Um, I was really lucky in that mum asked for phage therapy for her child. So this really was citizen science um, from the get go. And then luck that one of our microbiologists, James Suthill, knew Graham Hatful, who was working out of Pittsburgh on phage therapy. Um, really from a purely uh, research perspective. And so he, he put us in touch with um, Graham. And then Graham was in touch again by luck uh, or, or, or planning with Chip Schooley from uh, San Diego. So we, we happened to have a conference call to talk about two of my patients, one, one who sadly they couldn't find phage for and who died quite quickly after lung transplant. And then for the other patient that we've we've published on. So there was a lot of luck involved um, and there was a lot of hard work and collaboration with lots of different people. And then we just went through each step um, process to get that phage from the lab in Pittsburgh over to the UK and into our patient. And, and in terms of those steps, um, so there was sort of the uh, GMP practice for producing a medicinal product, which the uh, University of Pittsburgh had to do. Uh, we had to speak to the sort of health and safety executive at uh, NHS England about importing um, phage therapy into the UK. We had to go through the process of working out whether or not it was genetically modified. Uh, and then once we got it into the UK um, via the MHRA, we then had to go through our own sort of um, steps and barriers, which included going through ethics committee, going to the drugs and therapeutic committee, our cell therapy lab and Kim, Kimberly Gilmore was um, fantastic in taking those phage phages from a sort of vial and then prepping them up for our patient. The pharmacist, Katrina Ford, I have to mention, she went through all of those steps and worked pretty much full time for those 12 weeks in getting that phage for my patient. And then, of course, my wonderful patient and her family who consented to undergoing the procedure and agreeing to take that that step um, to, to try the phage therapy when all other conventional therapy had failed. So um, it took it took 12 weeks, but it took a, a, a village of people to make it happen, um, is what I'd say. And it was successful for a period of years for my patient. Thank you very much, Helen. I think it's safe to say we've got quite a diverse board uh, on, on, our, on our panel today, which represents probably only part of the village that it takes to you know, really move phase therapy forward. And um, somebody who sits in a very interesting position is Dr. Mal Hayes of Thunderbird at the Interface of Medicine and Academia. Um, we've heard a little bit from Simon about how phase therapy helps you know, cure your infection, your chronic UTIs. Um, can you talk to us a little bit more about your work and the impact that phase therapy can have on patients with dealing with that infection? I guess the main thing was is just coming from a unique background as someone who'd done research lab work, who became a medical doctor, who then carries on doing research, I kind of had 
that understanding of the biology and what needed to be done from a lab point of view. And I kind of ran with that and realized that actually, this is a great thing that could be used clinically. And you're just looking at all the barriers in the UK. And a lot of it is the fact that there are no strict criteria. There is no clinical trials. There are nothing to base it on. So I guess that was kind of my inspiration for Right, we've got it working, as you said, in a lab, and we proved that it works in a lab on a collection of strains that my main part of it is looking at antibiotic resistant infection, um, specifically UTIs, so urinary tract infections, and then it was saying, right, so we can prove that we get a collection of those, this works in the lab, now we're going to move it forward. So what we're currently doing is doing some animal studies to prove that it works in a biological setting, and then what we're hoping to do um, in the process of getting support for is to do a clinical trial which there are very few clinical trials um, that have been successfully completed in phage therapy and somebody's got to get the ball rolling and uh, we're going to try <laughs> so and, and like I said is it it's for these stories which is there are people out there who want something done and live with these infections and Antibiotics are not always a solution. I don't think antibiotics need to be put completely on the shelf, but they're not always the solution. And there is pressure out there and you want to do something good. And that's kind of where I'm standing from is I'm happy to treat infectious diseases. That's what I specialize in. But I don't think antibiotics are the answer. We need to come up with novel solutions. And I want to help with that in any way. Thank you very much, Martha. And finally, moving on to Martha. Um, who now works very closely with. Um, we are going to be the largest phase group in the UK um, and I've just established the Leicester Phage Centre. Uh, so as a leading researcher in the field, can you sort of tell us how the interest in phage therapy has evolved over the last few years and sort of the, the key role that the relationship between um, academics and positions plays in, in delivering education. Yeah, so the interest in the last few years has really, as Diane said, got really, really in, increased. And we can see that in the UK and globally in terms of just interest from doctors, from companies, pharmaceutical companies, biotech companies, and from the general public. And this is also manifested as well in terms of the amount of um, funding opportunities that are available and we can see it in terms of um, participation uh, to medically relevant conferences. So we can see that there's an interest being driven both from, from those two directions, from the general public and from the medical profession. And it's really being driven by this extreme need for novel antimicrobials. And I can see it, when I started my own laboratory in 2007, I was told, you never say your grants, on your grants that you want to um, use pages clinically. So I focused a lot really in the early years on just trying to understand the fundamental biology of bacteria pages. But now there's a lot more interest. We have a lovely flourishing group and where we hope to um, provide a lot of that fundamental knowledge to ensure that when phages are used, the correct phages are used. And I think the role of academia is incredibly important because I think you need, you need that deep detailed knowledge of bacteria phages to make sure that when you choose phages for your clinical trials, you're choosing phages with, 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 really, with properties that, make, that render those phages effective. So they're phages that don't generate resistance, phages that aren't immediately cleared by the immune system or don't promote a massive um, response, uh, phages that are broad spectrum in terms of their ability to kill within specific species. There's lots of, of actual biological characterization that you need to do. So I think academics have a big role there. And then of course, in terms of training the workforce, so both in terms of training people that will work in the companies who will develop products, and in terms of working with doctors, you know, that both, I mean, I love working with Mel because she's endlessly just giving me a clinical perspective and I'm and, and you know, she has, does have an experience in both, but um, you, you can see you really need that, that knowledge of how the organism works and how the humans work together. So I think, um, that, that partnership between academia, companies and doctors is going to be critical going forward. Thank you very much. Um, so we are running very short of time. We're okay? Okay, so we've got time for some questions. Is there anybody in the audience who has any questions they would like to ask? Oh, sorry. Hi, sorry. Thanks everyone for putting the conference together. Um, um, 
I'm, I'm here as a, as a patient I'm trying to research more about treatment for me and I'm interested in a couple of um, things specifically that were mentioned um, uh, by Diane and also um, the Minister. So in terms of um, um, biofilms and specifically beauty life biofilms, um, what sort of results have you seen from research or academia? Because um, in terms of UTIs, one of the issues is not necessarily the resistance of antibiotics yet, although that's an issue as well, but the inability of the antibiotics to penetrate the biofilm once the infection becomes chronic. And in a case like mine, where it's spread from the UTI to my kidneys, and now I don't have a choice, I have to take the antibiotics because, you know, that's where it is. So I'm just wondering, what, what does the research say? So supportive wise, that's kind of what we've aimed for and that's what we've kind of proven on the bench. So like you're saying, biofilms. So for everyone else, biofilms are kind of, I guess it's kind of like a sticky layer that will go on everything or like a gunk layer on top of stuff. And so what will happen is bacteria live within that gunk and that is actually quite nice and protective. It protects you from cleaning them. It protects them from getting antibiotics, getting to the bacteria to start off with. So it's quite living in within a biofilm quite happily. Now, one of the benefits of phages, and I think it's been mentioned earlier, is that they've grown together with bacteria. So they've learned to overcome some of these mechanisms. So a lot of phages, we call them Oshtan, the polymerases, but they have enzymes on them which break down the biofilm to allow them to get to the bacteria within a biofilm. And that is one of the properties that, within our own research, we've selected phages deliberately that have this activity. And two, it's actually been shown that even if you use some of these um, enzymes alongside antibiotics that also helps because if it breaks down the biofilm it actually even allows the antibiotics to get there as well so it has double benefits so that's the that is one of the things that people do focus on and i think particularly with utis that's where i know the most that's one of the, the bits that we're focusing on i was just getting aware of that okay. i was told that's why i needed nine months of treatment because the bladder's got many layers and it has to break down those those layers the same with the prostate so I felt like giving up a couple of times because every test that came through was, was still showing that bacteria. And I must admit that the day that I got, that I got my results back from any other and it's and it's no entrococcus, so I was like, really? I had to look at it like three times. And then I sent more results off to Microgen because I knew that they did it at a PCR level to really make sure it was gone. And I went, it's gone? Really? And yeah, it was... Do you feel it's not gone then? Like, do you feel it's gone? You don't feel like it's still there, despite what the temperature I will say I have some scarring, mm -hmm. and I still have a fair bit of frequency, but I've avoided a true, UT, a true UTI now for about three years. I did have one back in uh, November, but because it was treated quickly, it never really established. But to be fair, I did another course of phases back in January, which they advised to make sure it was gone. So, David Browning with Fixed Phage. I'd like to commend Phage UK and the panel for delivering a real compelling call to action today. So, so thank you. And my question is, how do we galvanise the uh, UK phage community and beyond to really get together and uh, start addressing the, uh, the challenges that have been discussed uh, tonight as well. So are you planning follow-up forums? And uh, many of us would be very keen to get involved with that. I was going to cover this in the closing remarks. <laughs> so Page UK is now uh, one year old, I think. Uh, have made reasonable progress. OK, what were the aims? To raise awareness of phase therapy in the UK, to form a network and UK clinicians and phage researchers to build traction and work together on the sourcing and production of phages and to facilitate their therapeutic use. Currently, that network consists of 45 clinicians, 
in 18 different NHS trusts in the UK. Um, and um, I think uh, it's, been, it's been very interesting that uh, virtually everybody who emails me is so excited about the possibility of having something like this, and they're very willing to join. The third aim, to work with a focused groups of a group of clinicians to establish a standardized framework for the safe and successful use of pages, making use of the current legislation in the UK. So 18 of the network, 45, have agreed to join the Phage UK clinical group. It had its first online meeting just over a week ago, and we have started discussing uh, how we can do this. So I think that's very promising. The fourth aim, to work with clinicians and regulatory bodies to ensure a suitable regulatory framework is available to facilitate clinical trials and wider access to phase therapy in the UK. And finally, to facilitate the availability of GMP manufacturing facilities for phages in the UK. Because as Mel pointed out, at the moment, if the phage is sourced from non-UK source and bought into the UK, <laughs> you can use the name um, patient route um, to treat a, a patient specifically with that phage. Um, but if it's manufactured in the UK, it's got to be to GMP or you can consider doing that. So, um, so that it is possible to treat patients at the moment and, and there's a, an NHS um, um, facility in Edinburgh that has treated 10 uh, diabetic foot ulcer patients under the name patient access scheme with phages imported into the UK. And I think nine out of 10 of those are successful. So it is possible to do that, and I think that's one thing we want to try and publicize, that you can do that, but you have to source from outside the UK, which is not ideal, ideal obviously. Um, so there's much still to be done, and with the help of the audience here tonight, and hopefully some of the many who are watching this event remotely, we should have said we, uh, over 100 people are watching us remotely, many of them working in the NHS. Um, so Phage UK will strive to continue its aim so the UK is not left behind in the use of phage therapy. And uh, I'd like to uh, thank the Side Business School, Incate, uh, all the valuable uh, contributions from the panel members, uh, remote and in the audience. Um, and finally, um, Fran uh, for her um, wonderful advice to Page UK and Stephanie for organizing this event and starting Page UK. I'm sorry, that was a long winded answer, but hopefully it addresses your question. Thank you again, Diane and Will, uh, for helping organising the board. And uh, we'll see you very soon. Okay, thanks, everyone. Thank you. Well. Thank you.